Association webinar for uh, common breathing disorders. And we, the breathing disorders overview of the three types of sleep apnea. And our speaker is Joseph Anderson. He is a certified clinical sleep health educator, a respiratory therapist, and a registered sleep technologist. Um, he is at the McGuire VA Medical Center in Richmond, Virginia. And he has authored numerous publications. We're very lucky to have him as part of our team. Um, I guess I need to give you a little bit of housekeeping information. We will, at the end of the presentation, talk about, uh, you know, if anybody would like to ask a question live, we will unmute you. You can, there's a little, uh, a little, uh, icon that you can click to raise your hand. So if you raise your hand at the end, then we will unmute you and you can ask your question live. Or if you prefer, you can type your question into the chat area and we can look at them there. Um, now, if you are watching the recorded version of this webinar, in the future, <laughs> you may email your questions straight to us at asaa at sleepapnea.org. Now, without further ado, let me welcome Joe, and thank you for, for coming today, Joe. Well, good morning, uh, good morning to those of you uh, east of where, or west of where I am, and good afternoon to the rest of you. We're going to go through quite a number of slides uh, today and try to do a basic overview of the three types of sleep apnea. And we have a few objectives that we want to try to reach um, by going through this. And we're going to look at some of the different types of sleep apnea. Uh, how are they diagnosed and some of the common treatments as well. And then maybe a little bit of what you should ask your doctor. And then at the end, we'll have some time for some questions. Again, we're, this isn't to take place of medical advice. This is just to give you an overview. Uh, we get a lot of questions from people who ask, you know, how do you diagnose sleep apnea? Or how do you diagnose central apnea? Things like that. So that's what we're going to try to talk about today. But to start with, let's talk about some of the risk factors of, of even having any type of apnea. And if we look at the high apnea risk factors, we're going to see things such as obesity. It's probably one of the bigger risk factors of someone developing uh, an apnea. Of course, increasing age and even the male gender. I myself, I'm 60 years old and uh, I'm a bit overweight. So as, as I age, just the sheer fact that I'm male, I get older, uh, I get a little heavier, it increases my risk for developing some type of apnea, whether that's obstructive sleep apnea, uh, central sleep apnea, or, or mixed sleep apnea. And then if you have any type of anatomical abnormalities, um, something that blocks your airway, uh, blocks the, the way that you're able to breathe. And, and when we talk about apneas, we're primarily talking about upper airway abnormalities, but it can also be a little bit lower in the body than just the upper airway. When we get to central apneas, we're looking more along the neurological disorders. In other words, is the body telling you to breathe or, and, and you're just not doing it, or are you actually not being told to breathe? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then some of the comorbidities that you may have. Have you already developed a history of, of cardiac issues or diabetes, cancer, uh, muscular disorders such as uh, ALS or MS or anything along those lines. Even family history uh, increases your risk factor for having apnea. It's not necessarily um, familial or, or genetics, but it does seem to be more common in families. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that if, if someone is obese in the family, chances are that other family members will be obese as well. And clinically obese may, is different from the way you may feel. You may be slightly overweight 
and feel just perfectly fine with, with your weight, and, and that's great. But there is a clinical line that gets crossed when we start talking about obesity. Uh, alcohol or sedative use. There's a lot of um, misconceptions when it comes to alcohol. For instance, taking a drink uh, at night is going to help you sleep better, and, and that's really not true. It may, in fact, help you go to sleep more quickly, but it tends to disrupt your sleep or fragment your sleep. Uh, but if you're a heavy alcohol user or, or use a lot of sedatives, you're going to increase your risk, obviously, for having uh, periods of non-breathing, which is what an apnea is. And the same thing with smoking. If you smoke a lot, you're going to damage your lungs, and that's going to cause problems as well. So let's look a little bit about the difference between respiration and ventilation. These two terms are often... Um, used in error, I guess. If you hear it, if you watch some of the TV shows, you'll see them call respiratory therapy and they say they're gonna put somebody on a respirator. Well, they're not really putting a person on a respirator, they're putting a person on a ventilator. Respiration and ventilation are two different things. And, and I'm showing you this slide because in order to understand the apneas, you have to understand a little bit about the, the process that we have to respirate and to ventilate and to breathe. So respiration is defined as the air moving in and out of our body. That's inhalation and exhalation. And we do this primarily through our nose, but our mouth is the alternate uh, source of, of doing the breathing. And then ventilation itself is more internal in the body. And that's where the O2 and the CO2 cross into the bloodstream, where the lungs are pulling out the CO2, which is the, the byproduct of our, of our cells, if you will and replacing that with oxygen. So in order to have ventilation, we have to have respiration, right? We have to have the air going in and out. And then in order to get the oxygen to ourselves, we're gonna to have to have the ventilation component. So some of the abnormalities of breathing during sleep results from obstruction of the upper airway. Now that obstruction can take place in a lot of different ways. It can be uh, positional, it can be weight related. It, again, it could be from some form of abnormality of the upper airway. We can also have a loss of ventilatory tone, or we could have a combination of either one of those. And, and we can also have the neurological disorders. And again, we'll talk briefly about neurological disorders when we get into the, the central apnea component. But what actually controls breathing? Well, we have an autonomic nervous system, and we have a couple different nervous systems, but we're gonna talk about the autonomic. Now, the autonomic nervous system is what allows us to breathe. We don't think about breathing, do we? Um, if we thought about breathing, we would probably be in big trouble. We certainly wouldn't be able to sleep. So this goes on by itself. Our body takes care of this for us. So we have an autonomic control, but we also have a metabolic control, and that's a chemical control. And that chemical could can, um, be a high level of CO2 or a low level of CO2, or even other chemicals in our bodies, um, high or low, that can control our breathing or at least encourage our body to breathe. So during sleep, respiration is certainly controlled by either the autonomic nervous system or the metabolic control. So this keeps the ventilatory pattern regular and ensures that the needs of the body are met by respiration and ventilation. And that means that we can go to sleep and feel reasonably assured that we're gonna continue breathing throughout the night. So respiration is dependent on some type of incoming stimuli, wherever that's coming from. Well, again, whether it's the autonomic or whether it's metabolic. So oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood really control this. And I like to say it's like a seesaw. If you remember as a kid sitting on a seesaw and if you have somebody heavy on one side of the seesaw, that side of the seesaw is gonna go down and the other side of the seesaw is gonna go up. And then it can be reversed. So if you have a lot of CO2, uh, you're gonna have um, a change in the O2. If you have a change in the O2, you're gonna have a change in the CO2. And it really is a seesaw effect. And that seesaw effect oftentimes is a contributing factor to our breathing. 
And then you throw in, like you see in the, the picture there, the guy standing on top of the mountain. Um, some of you may very well be on top of the mountain at this point, but uh, being acutely exposed uh, to high altitude may cause periodic breathing and sometimes even can cause central sleep apneas. So I mentioned there are basically three types of apnea. Now there are many, many types of breathing disorders and there are types of breathing disorders that are not apneas. Um, and we're gonna define what each of these apneas are, but we're gonna talk about obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and then mixed apneas. And now mixed apnea is a, uh, a hybrid, if you will, of both the obstructive apnea and a central apnea. So starting with obstructive sleep apnea, we generally breathe through our nose. That's why we have the nose. It's not necessarily there to keep our glasses up on our face, although it does a pretty good job of doing that. Uh, it's designed to, for us to breathe through. It has a series of filters. It has a series of turbinates uh, behind the nose that actually break up the air and help warm the air. And of course, the, the hair in our nose and things like that will help filter and filter everything that we're breathing in so we don't get that, that bean or something stuck up our nose. But if we aren't able to breathe through our nose, then our secondary uh, source for breathing is our mouth. So if we have any type of obstruction in the nose, deviated septum, allergies, uh, uh, excess tissue, uh, other uh, deformities, it's going to cause an obstruction. And that obstruction can very well lead to uh, one of the apneas that we're talking about. But if we're not breathing through our nose, we'll, we'll breathe through our mouth. Okay? And this is a nice little diagram of looking inside the mouth. And you can see, uh, let me see if I can get my, my little uh, laser pointer to work here. It may work, it may not work. <laughs> there we go. But you can see it, it talks about the uvula and the tonsils and the tongue. Now any of these can be enlarged or swollen or just just by birth being large. And that's often why we have our tonsils removed as, as a child. Now, I still have uh, my tonsils, uh, but I do have sleep apnea, but it's not because of my tonsils, it's because of my uh, larger neck size and being an older male. But if we have some type of nasal congestion or swelling of the throat or tonsillitis or, or even temporary allergies, that too can lead to uh, the type of, of apnea we're talking about here, which is obstructive sleep apnea. Some other things that could cause that is, is uh, a virus called the Epstein-Barr, okay? And it's, it's known to be able to dramatically increase the size of the lymphoid uh, tissues when you're having this acute infection. So obstructive sleep apnea is fairly common in acute cases of severe inf infectious mononucleosis, for example. So when we look at the airway in general, uh, if we look at a non-obstructed airway here and an obstructed airway, look where this circle is and you can see that the air is coming in and out of the nose. There's no real obstruction there. We're not breathing through the mouth at this point. We're breathing the way we're supposed to in and out of the nose. And then we look over at this slide, this picture, and we can see that there's an obstruction there. Now, what's happened is there's an occlusion because Perhaps the tongue is swollen or another part of the upper airway is occluding this. So this is typically what we see when we have an obstructive sleep apnea. So how do we diagnose uh, obstructive sleep apneas? Well, any of the apneas we're talking about means that the person has to stop breathing for a period of time. How common does this happen? Well, it's estimated that 10 to 30 percent of adults who snore have obstructive sleep apnea. Now that doesn't mean that if you snore you have apnea, but it also doesn't mean if you don't snore that you don't have apnea. Snoring is, is simply an indicator that uh, further investigation is needed because you might have an apnea, um, but really snoring is a social problem and tends to be more of a sleep disorder for the other person in the bedroom than it is for the person that's actually doing the snoring. And when you come into a sleep lab, we generally don't 
initially treat snoring as a sleep disorder. Mm -hmm. However, if we are treating uh, another uh, a disorder, we tend to include mm -hmm. treating snoring as part of the routine. Also notice that we have 2% of women have obstructive sleep apnea. And remember, this is just one form of apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. And that number tends to increase postmenopausal. 4% of men have obstructive sleep apnea, so nearly twice. And that's what I said at the very beginning of this. If you're male, your chances of having obstructive sleep apnea are higher than if you're female. And of course, as you age, we're talking about adults here um, that snore, you're going to see a, a higher increase in the likelihood of OSA. You know, Joe, I wanted to bring up something here that is just, I think that if there are any spouses on this webinar right now that they could totally relate to this. Back in the day when we were trying to raise awareness about sleep apnea and snoring, and w there were a group of uh, sleep technologists that had a, they offered a free sleep study to the spouse that sent the loudest snore in on a recording. So they did an audio recording of their spouse sleeping and Believe it or not, there were there were people that you know sent some in, but there was a, a, a fellow that they could hear that he was having apnea during the snoring. The wife did not know, and so they had they ended up giving free sleep studies to the the actual snoring person that was the loudest, but they also felt that fellow that was not breathing needed one too so that was that was kind of an interesting way uh back you know it's not a funny matter but uh, you know sure back it then it was it was a way to i mean the spouses are really really their sleep is definitely impacted yeah. so if you're not if you're not a victim of the snoring the snoring can be quite humorous you know, and, and it brings up a good point, Teresa, that a lot of times the spouse is the person who sends um, the other person to the sleep lab because they hear them snoring and snoring and snoring, and then they hear them stop snoring, and they're not snoring. They're just dead silent. Nothing's happening. And 10, 12, 15, 30, 40, 50 seconds go by, and then the person gasps and begins snoring again. So oftentimes when we do have a patient come into the sleep lab, it's because the spouse has sent them there. Um, not always, because sometimes the patient themselves are self-aware of the fact that they're, they're um, you know, wore out all the time and having other issues. All right, so how do we diagnose obstructive sleep apnea? Well, currently we generally use two types of testing methods. One of them is a home sleep test, and it's a, a limited sensor test that's performed in the home. Um, by the patient themselves, and it's usually used to rule in or to rule out obstructive sleep apnea. That's the OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, and this is generally done for a person who has no other comorbidities. That they don't, they're not a cardiac patient. They don't have severe diabetes. Um, they're not a child, you know, so we can look at doing a home sleep test for that person. And again, we either rule in or out or we determine that we can't decide one way or the other. And if we rule in that they have obstructive sleep apnea, we oftentimes will put them on uh, immediate treatment. If we're unable to determine if they have sleep apnea or we rule out that they have sleep apnea, or if they have other comorbidities or even other types of sleep disorders other than obstructive sleep apnea, we'll bring them in for what's known as a polysomnogram uh, or a PSG. And the PSG is what most people I think are more accustomed to, to knowing about these days. And that's an attended in-lab multi-sensor study. Um, and it's used for a whole range of sleep disorders from parasomnias, which can include uh, sleepwalking and, and uh, nightmares and talking in your sleep and, and uh, leg movements and all kinds of other things that might happen that go beyond the scope of this particular uh, presentation. But those things would be done inside of a regular sleep lab. So if we look at obstructive sleep apnea, and you can see some of the signs and symptoms here, it turns into a vicious kind of circle, all right? So we may or may not have the snoring. We might have some insomnia, and insomnia means difficulty going to sleep. 
Um, if they snore a lot, you might have some dry mouth and you wake up with a morning headache. Why might you wake up with a headache? Well, some of that may have to do with the snoring and some of it may have to do with the fact that you might be depriving your body of oxygen. Because when you stop breathing, remember we go back to respiration and ventilation, that if you're, that's not happening and you're not pulling that CO2 out and putting oxygen back into your body, you could end up depriving your head, your brain of oxygen and you could have some morning headaches. Uh, memory loss, right? Even attention deficit, right? These cognitive abilities that we have um, could, could be affected by the, the lack of oxygen or the breathing problems. Depression, moodiness, fatigue, uh, nocturia, you could have a lot of frequent urination at night where you need to get up and go to the bathroom. Impotence, if that doesn't get the attention of some of you out there, um, you might want to think about that. So, so one of the common things that we see in this big circle here is as we get older, sometimes we think these are just things that are happening to us because we're aging. And there's probably some truth to some of that, but some of this could be happening because we have a sleep disorder. And uh, again, the more common sleep or the most common sleep disorder is uh, some form of an apnea. So when we do one of these studies, whether it's HST or the polysomnogram, what we're looking at is a reduction in airflow at least 90%, closer to 100%. And we're going to look at a couple of waveforms here in a minute. You're going to see what normal breathing looks like, and then you're going to see what an apnea looks like. And then that apnea not only has to be uh, reduced by 90% or more, it has to last at least 10 seconds long. Now, 10 seconds doesn't necessarily sound like a long time, but if you're listening to somebody that you love and care about not breathing, 10 seconds is an eternity. And a lot of our patients stop breathing for a lot longer than 10 seconds. So we wanna have the reduction in airflow. We wanna have that reduction lasting at least 10 seconds, but we also want to see effort. And this is critical for an obstructive sleep apnea. This person is trying to breathe. We have belts on their chest and their abdomen and they're trying to breathe. We see the effort, but no air is getting through. That's classic obstructive sleep apnea. So some of the consequences of obstructive sleep apnea, I mean, they're kind of all over the place what can happen. Sleep fragmentation. Again, you're, you're waking up, you're going to sleep. You're waking up, you're going to sleep. This puts a lot of stress on, on your cardiovascular system. Um, other consequences of obstruction can, hope you can still see me, it says my internet connection is giving me issues. Obesity hypoventilation, that's when a person has so much weight around their gut and maybe they're laying on their back or their side that the, their actual weight, the excess weight is pressing down and hypo meaning less than hyper meaning more than, hypo meaning less than. So they're breathing less because of the obesity. And then excessive daytime sleepiness. And there's a variety of questionnaires and, and interviewing techniques that we use to help determine whether somebody has uh, EDS. And then we go back to the level, the chemical levels in the, in the blood. We talked about the CO2, uh, oxygen, and that's where we get into terms like hypoxemia, uh, which is low oxygen or hypercapnia, which is high levels of CO2. So let's look at a typical waveform that we would see in a sleep lab. A lot of this, I know there's a lot of different things going on, but this is why um, a trained uh, technician would, would do a sleep study and be able to go through this and do what we call scoring. We look at this data and we compare your information to uh, normal information or information that we would expect to see. So pretty much ignore all this up here, but these are brain waves. All right, let's focus right in here. This is your where we have a sensor uh, around your nose, and this is where we're seeing a huge reduction in airflow. So we see normal airflow going on through here, and then all of a sudden the airflow goes away and it lasts at least 10 seconds. This whole image that you're looking at is 30 seconds wide. From here, all the way over to here is 30 seconds. And it gives you a little bit of a scale. And then notice under where you're seeing the apnea or the reduction in airflow, you still see effort. These are the belts. So this is a classic sign that we would see of someone with obstructive sleep apnea. They're breathing, then they stop breathing, 
okay? But they still have all this effort. And then up here you see an arousal, and this is where the person's brain wakes up. And it may not wake them up from their sleep, but it's certainly gonna wake their brain up. Now this can happen a, a few times an hour, or this can happen many, many, many times an hour. And we'll talk about the severity of obstructive sleep apnea or apnea in general in a little bit. This is another example where we have a normal breathing going on. We have a reduction in the flow or the what? The respiration, right? Uh, going on, but we still have effort. Now the effort's kind of reduced here, but we still have the effort. So just another example of what OSA looks like. And one final example here, look how long this person has this reduction in airflow. And then they have this gasp and they have this arousal in their brain and they breathe some more. Uh, and then this pattern just repeats itself over and over again. All right, that's so called that's the recovery breath right there. When you hear your spouse or you, you know, that they are just gasping and sort of a snorting sound, that's what that is. They, their brain, you know, they are, the body is just going, please breathe or you're going to die, you know. So. Well, you're not going to, I won't go into they're going to die, but they're going to, they're going to be very uncomfortable. Um, let's look at central sleep apnea now. And I, and I think some of you are probably here specifically for this part of the presentation. Uh, notice that central sleep apnea is less than 10% of the people who have a breathing disorder. But that's not 10% of the population. That's 10% of the patients who already have a sleep disorder breathing. Uh, actually have central sleep apnea. Notice how it's diagnosed. Okay, we do a polysomnogram for this, and that's that multi-sensor in-lab study. And we also use the witness uh, questionnaire, and that's what Teresa was talking about earlier, that the spouse may see that the person doesn't breathe. Well, if they have obstructive apnea, they probably hear, hear or see them not breathing, but they see them trying to breathe. In this case, the person isn't even trying to breathe. Central apnea, again, is when the body is either um, sending the signal to breathe and it's not getting through to where it needs to get through so that the person can breathe or the signal is never being sent in the first place. So we're looking at a look, mostly neurological disorder. Uh, not always uh, primarily neurological, but there's certainly a strong neurological component. So when we look at the polysomnogram, for the sleep study, we're gonna look at a 100% reduction in airflow. Where the uh, obstructive sleep apnea, we were looking at 90% or more reduction, now we're looking at 100%. Same 10 seconds, but this time, no chest or abdominal effort. Again, if you're trying to breathe and you have a reduction in airflow, it's gonna lead more toward the obstructive side. If you're not even trying to breathe, we're gonna look at the central side of sleep apnea. So here's some of the, the theories that we have when it comes to central sleep apnea. If the PCO2, and that's our carbon, our carbon dioxide, drops below a certain level, the brain is likely to become dysrhythmic. Dysrhythmic means out of rhythm, okay? That's not normal. So when we have some type of abnormality that, you know, all of our little um, triggers in our brain go off and we start thinking about what this person could have. Well, if we look at sleep onset, the PCO2 needed to stimulate breathing in wake certainly differs from sleep, so the apnea or the arousal threshold itself resets. And we have what's known as a deficient ventilation control. During sleep, the behavior or wakefulness stimuli no longer available, and that results in central events. And that's just a fancy way of saying what I said a few minutes ago, that you may not be telling your body to breathe, or if you are telling yourself to breathe, it's not getting through. I mentioned that it's uh, often neurological or primarily neurological. Well, any neurological disorder that affects the metabolic control system could lead to central apneas. Now, this could be uh, damage to the brainstem. That can certainly lead to hypoventilation. Remember, hypo meaning less, less than. Um, so if we have some type of trauma, brain tumors, anything along those lines, that could also help lead uh, to central sleep apnea. And then chronic muscle uh, diseases, as I mentioned before. So let's look at a waveform from central sleep apnea. 
In this case, we have normal breathing going on, and then all of a sudden, we have um, a 90% or more reduction. In fact, in this case, we have what's close to 100%, if not 100% reduction. And then look under that reduction. Do we see any effort in these belts? No. So we have the, the near 100% reduction. We have no effort going on. So this is a classic central sleep apnea. And then the patient starts to breathe again, and then you can see that the central sleep apnea repeats itself. Let's look at another waveform. Uh, again, all this brain activity going on up here, and this, this, is, this is a couple of epics. That's what we call a, a snapshot of 30 seconds of, of a sleep study. This happens to be a couple of epics squished together. But we have normal breathing going on. This patient happens to be on CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. So they're being treated for apnea. And then we, again, we have a central sleep apnea. We have no effort going on underneath the, the apnea with a near 100% reduction. We happen to have an arousal. We don't uh, necessarily have to have an arousal, but this is um, what gives you that excessive daytime sleepiness uh, is this, this brain waking up. Now, if you look way down here, you may barely be able to see it. This is our oxygen levels. Our oxygen levels, after we have one of these events, our oxygen levels begin to drop, 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 drop. Now this happens quite often for years, if not decades of untreated sleep disorders. And this is what beats up on our organs, such as our heart, uh, having that oxygen deprivation. So we've talked about obstructive sleep apnea. We've talked about central sleep apnea. There's a third apnea that we often see in a sleep lab, and it's called mixed. And yet, yeah, you guessed it, it's a mixture of obstructive sleep and central sleep. Again, we're going to use a polysomnogram or a PSG, and we're going to use the questionnaires to see if uh, the bed partner or somebody has, has seen this happen. But when we go to diagnose it, it's going to uh, be very similar to the other two with one critical um, exception. We're looking at a 90% or more reduction in airflow. We're still looking at the 10 seconds. But this time, if we look at the belts, which is right in here, we're going to look with no chest or no abdominal effort for an undetermined or undefined time, followed by effort. So in other words, we're going to have a period of time where they are not even trying to breathe, what looks like central followed by the fact that they are going to try to breathe, all happening under the same lack of breathing. So in this case, the patient's breathing. Then they have this long apnea. It's certainly more than 90%, so we know it's some type of apnea. It's longer than 10 seconds. Uh, we look under this. When I say this is like looking under the hood of a car, we look under this hood, and we have a central component where they're not trying to breathe on the abdomen. We have a central component where they're not trying to breathe on the chest. Okay. In this case, the actual the chest and abdomen are up here. And then they start having that effort again. So they have a central component followed by effort. If this had actually been reversed where the effort was in the beginning and the central component was at the end, it would be an obstructive sleep apnea and not a mixed. Well, look at that SAO2 is really visible on that. Yep. Yep. They, uh, you can see, you're right, the SAO2 does drop down. You can see it wavering as it goes up and down following the breathing pattern. Another real nice example of a person who has all this breathing going on, and then they have this long, long apnea, and we want to figure out what kind of apnea. Well, we have a central component followed by effort on either belt, central component followed by effort. So now we have a mixed sleep apnea. So when we look at apneas, we, catalog, we catalog apneas uh, as a group of things, uh, particularly um, how it affects our, our lives. And I love this chart because in the middle here, we're gonna see the sleep apnea. And if you look out at some of these little uh, extensions that come out, we're gonna see impotence and hypertension um, obesity, and that's the chicken and the egg thing. Obesity can lead to uh, breathing disorders such as apnea, but 
Untreated apnea can also increase the obesity, which then makes the apnea even worse. Drowsiness, fatigue, diabetes, these can all lead to motor vehicle accident, job impairment, heart attacks, headaches, stroke, uh, dementia, memory loss. So many things that can happen from an untreated apnea, whether it's obstructive, central, or mixed. Now, I said that we would rate how severe excessive daytime sleepiness is, and this is the, the consensus we most sleep labs will use. Uh, if you're sleepy, that just means, you know, you, probably not much of a bother. We all get kind of sleepy. Um, but, and, and you might see some events five to 14 times a minute, I'm, excuse me, an hour. Five to 14 times an hour. That means five to 14 times an hour, you stop breathing for at least 10 seconds, okay? And that may or may not lead to a mental arousal and that may or may not lead to the oxygen levels dropping. And this is why we have to do a sleep study so we can see those things. But what if you're doing it 14 to 30 times per hour or even 30 times or more? And I myself have seen people that stop breathing more than 100 times an hour. That's each and every hour that they sleep. So if we do a six hour sleep study, they may have more than uh, an average of more than 100 events per hour. So that's 600 times at night, they stop breathing for at least 10 seconds or more. That's a big problem. Okay. So when we have patients who go with untreated uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, usually as a result of a sleep disorder, we're definitely going to see an increase in motor vehicle accidents. We're going to see an increase in work accidents because a person is drowsy. We're going to see a poor job performance. And those of you who work in an office, you know if you close your eyes or set your head down, that's the exact moment that your supervisor or coworker is going to walk by and see your eyes closed. Um, it's going to uh, cause family discord because we all know that we get more argumentative with our family when we're tired. And all of these are gonna to lead to a decreased quality of life. And, and after all, that's what we want. We wanna find out if we have a sleep disorder and if we have a sleep disorder, what type do we have and how best we can treat it, all right? So let's talk a little bit about treatment here for a, a few slides. Um, one of the things that people say all the time is, is, is apneas are often caused by obesity. Well, they say lose weight. Well guess what? If the person was likely to lose weight, they would have lost weight a long time ago for a lot of other reasons, because chances are apnea is not the only health concern that they have. Uh, by the time you get to be my age at 60 and you get into a sleep disorder center, you may already have cardiac issues and diabetes and other things, and you've been told your entire life to lose weight. But if they can lose weight, it oftentimes will either eliminate the problem that they're having or reduce the, the problem that they're having and maybe they need less treatment to fix it. Um, another behavioral therapy that we would look to do is avoidant of alcohol or sedation. We already talked about the fact that it can fragment your sleep. Avoid depriving yourself of sleep. Okay? Stop staying up all night. Um, most of the sleep techs that I know work nights and then try to have a daytime life with their family. So they already have a sleep disorder. It's called shift sleep disorder because they're part of the week working nights and part of the week they're trying to um, stay up during the day to be with their family. Sometimes we can go with uh, positional therapy. Uh, oftentimes our patients have these events worst on their back and that's what supine means that they're laying on their back. So we can teach a person to lay on their side uh, and there's a variety of ways we can do that from uh, physical means, little uh, tennis balls and other um, things we can put on their backs to help uh, train them not to sleep on their back, it may help eliminate some of their apneas. But we can also use what's known as uh, PAP therapy. Okay? And, and uh, there's various kinds of PAP therapy. And again, that falls outside of, the, uh, of this particular talk, but I'm sure that down the road we'll have a talk about the different types of PAP therapy that's out there. But in this case, we're talking about continuous positive airway pressure. And what that does is it basically just comes in here and splints this airway open. And by splinting it open, it re makes that um, obstruction go away. So another type of therapy that we might use is an oral appliance therapy. And an oral appliance therapy, as you can see right here, is a device that the person puts in their mouth and it may reposition 
their jaw, it may reposition their tongue. And again, this is normally done in conjunction with a, a good sleep lab and a good dentist that specializes in oral appliances. Another option could be surgical treatment. Um, there's lots of different types of surgery. Um, I'm not gonna say they're any more successful or any less successful than um, PAP, but I personally would probably not go down this path unless I tried other forms of therapy first, such as positive airway pressure or an oral appliance, because once you do this, once you go in and you start cutting up your, your airway, there's no going back, you know, and it can certainly change your, the, your voice as, as well as change uh, um, a lot of other aspects of your life and you might still end up having to have additional therapy. So think long and hard about surgery, but again, for some people, it's great. Ox oxygen. Uh, sometimes patients are on oxygen because of uh, non-sleep related disorders, but sometimes putting a patient on oxygen is a way to treat a sleep disorder, particularly someone who has a mild form of apnea or a way to help augment the apnea therapy they're already on. And then of course there's medications. And again, we won't go into a lot of uh, medications at this point, but uh, always you know, work closely with you, not only your, your sleep doctor, but also your primary care uh, provider to see what's best for you. So Teresa, at this point, I'm um, open to questions. If anybody um, would like to ask anything that I might be able to answer for you. If you just raise your hand, we can unmute you. I see <clears throat> there's one up there. Uh, John Saltenberger. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. So a question is uh, related to your last topic there regarding oxygen. Um, for folks who are suffering from sleep apnea, would supplemental oxygen, say, after a waking in the morning prove to be any help to eliminate the brain fog and headaches and whatnot uh, that, that uh, arrive overnight from uh, apnea nights? When I say supplemental oxygen, I mean like a can that you see as uh, athletes using for a quick shot of, of, of uh, oxygen. Yeah. Uh, I don't really have a direct answer to that. However, I can tell you that we do have patients um, who have claimed that that does help them. Um, in, in, and I've been doing this for 33, 34 years now. I personally haven't really had a physician that would order um, oxygen for a patient after they wake up for a short period of time. I do remember when the oxygen bars were a big thing and people were going there and getting all these, this oxygen uh, to, to increase their mood. But you would think that it would make, there'd be some logic behind that, particularly for a person who wakes up with morning headaches uh, that's due to oxygen deprivation, that having some form of oxygen in the morning might help. But John, I haven't, I haven't seen it myself, but patients have told me that are on oxygen at home that will, they don't, aren't necessarily on it at night, nocturnal oxygen, they're on it during the day. And they tell me that as soon as they get on the oxygen that they tend to feel better. Now, maybe it's just because they need the oxygen or maybe there is that correlation between the apnea and the, and the oxygen in the morning. Understood, thanks. Yes, sir, thank you. Scott, would you still, would you had earlier uh, wanted to speak. Would you like to do that now? Let's see. I can't see whose hand is raised from my view here. I don't see anybody's hand up at the moment. Oh yeah, there is Myrna. Okay. And I have a, another question in the queue for you. If somebody can unmute Myrna. Um, okay. There you go. Hi. Hi, Myrna. Hi. Um, I use the CPAP, but I'm having problems because I'm on a lot of medications for high blood pressure and such, and I'm on two diuretics. Now, the problem is uh, my mouth gets so dry that I last maybe half an hour to an hour. I use up about a third of the tank of water and I have to drink a lot of water, go up, go to the bathroom, start again and again. 
and I just get so worn out, I can't do much and I can't use the CPAP the way I want to. It, do you have any ideas? What type of mask are you on right now? I've got an air fit. Okay, so you have a full face mask? Full face mask, yeah. Okay. Um, are you a mouth breather more than a nasal a, breather? That's a real problem. I'm a real mouth breather and my I've got allergic rhinitis. My nasal passages dry out and I can't breathe very well through my nose. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's I'm also a full face mask wearer and um, depending depending on my night, I can end up using, uh, needing a lot of humidity or and being very dry. Yes. One of the things that I have found that helps me, and we recommend it to sort some of our patients, and you may have tried this already, is biotin. I'm, um, yeah, I'm using that biotin and a mouth cote and things like that. And I drink a lot of water at night. Yeah, me too. I, I keep a big cup with a straw on it that I can you know, pull my mask to the side a little bit um, and drink the water. I don't know if there's a, an easy answer for that. It's just some people are more susceptible to dryness and you may have some very high pressures going on. Um, do you have a heated hose with your CPAP machine? I recently got one, yeah, but I, I've sort of gone, I sort of switched between them. Now I've gone back to the other one because then I think maybe it won't dry it out as much. Yeah, and that's, do do that? well, we, a lot of times we go to a heated hose because it increases the humidity and reduces some of the rain out or the large water particles in the hose and that tends to increase humidity that you as the patient are right. going to get. And if we can increase the humidity, um, particularly since you're breathing through your mouth and as we said, there's no way of, moist, of, of moistening that air uh, through your body when you breathe through your mouth. So it has to happen externally. Right. So um, using a heated hose, and it may not help you, but hopefully it'll help uh, somebody else if they're having some uh, oral uh, dryness is to use a heated hose. And if you don't have one, you can get one through your DME company, your durable I, medical equipment company. Yeah, I recently got a heated hose, but uh, I didn't know if it was making it worse or better. So I'll go back to the heated hose then. Yeah, no, it will definitely make it better. Um, what you, 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 I'm assuming that you probably keep your room on the cooler side. I am now, yes. Yeah. The other thing that the heated hose will do is help keep that cooler air from uh, warming up the outside surface of the hose, which causes the rain out. And if you get the large rain out or large particles of water, that's water that's not turning into, into humidity. That's not getting into your mouth. Not the way you want it anyway. Yeah. I, I don't know if that helped you. Um, you may just be one of those people like I am that has to drink a lot of water because it sounds like you're doing everything right. You've got the, the biotin. Another thing you might want to try is some nasal saline that you put up your nose just before you put the mask on. Oh. Uh, that I may use, help. I yes. use a... Um, uh, like a neti pot type thing, but I do, and it's sort of like a nasal thing. I, I do a rinse in the morning every day and sort of clean out the congestion. Right. That's not drying out my nose too much, is it? Or is that helping? No, that's probably helping. Helping, yeah. Yep. Should, should I maybe increase that to twice a day or, or just? Uh, I don't, yeah. Something like that. I don't think you can harm yourself in any way by uh, trying it out. So give it a shot yeah. and see how it yeah. goes. The other thing is, um, I've got a lot of arthritis in the back of my neck, the, you know, and sometimes the um, the strap of the um, of the CPAP mask uh, it really cuts in and causes problems. So I've been trying different things. I also have sort of uh, a sensitivity to do. Um, to the silicone and the mask. So I've been trying out uh, like little liners for my face, you know, between right. the mask. So I'm sort of juggling all this stuff and trying to, you know, fix the problem, so to Have speak. Have you tried Renzi's? Yeah, yeah, I got a, a free sample okay. and I'm trying, trying with that, yeah. Well, I'm hoping we're gonna do a presentation sometime in the next couple of months on PAP therapy and we can go into a lot more specific yeah. details to mask fitting and, 
and things, but I will leave you with this. And then um, the tighter the mask isn't necessarily the best approach to go. Right. Uh, these masks are designed to be loosely worn. Um, and if you're having issues with the straps, then seriously consider are there one, loosening a mask, or two, going to a different brand of mask. There are literally dozens of different types of masks that are out there where yeah. the straps will hit you in, on your head in a different location. Right. Do, do, uh, what do you think about the fabric masks? Um, it, it goes back to the same thing with the heated hose. We've had, I've had patients who have had success with it and I've had others who haven't. I, um, from my personal experience, um, it doesn't work for me. But yeah. again, I know patients who it does work. Yeah. But well, when we get to the CPAP presentation, we're going to talk all kinds of masks, I promise. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Myrna. Okay. We can um, unmute Scott. Can someone? I'm not able to do that. While you're looking at that, Teresa, there's a, a question that was asked here about Medicare uh, and oral appliances if a patient has received the CPAP. Um, yes, medic, uh, insurance with Medicare will cover an oral appliance. Okay, I see that I'm uh, unmuted right now. Can you hear me? Sure. Um, uh, by the way, uh, I'm, I've been a hose head since uh, the end of 2005, I'm sorry, 2005. So I, I've been treating it for quite a while. I had it really bad. Um, uh, right now, my, my machine is an S8 uh, ResMed. It, it's a, the old VPAP Auto 25. Recently, ResMed stopped making the smart cards for that. So um, you know, my doctor is not able to get any information off of it. Um, unfortunately, I'm on disability. Don't, you know, don't, and investing in a new machine is, would be a, putting a serious crunch on our finances. Um, even, even doing a payment plan. Um, I mean, this is continuing to work for me, but uh, I've been told by the people that adjust my machine that it's now obsolete. And, and what's your name, sir? I don't have it up oh, on my screen. I'm sorry, my name is Scott. Scott, okay. Well, you know, you've come to the right place. First of all, you know, we're, again, down the road, we're gonna talk more about CPAPs and masks and things. However, mm -hmm. uh, the American Sleep Apnea Association has a CPAP and mask program uh, to help people get more modern equipment that they, if they initially can't afford it or don't have the insurance coverage to get it. Mm -hmm. So I would, uh, Teresa, are you there? Yes, I am. Are you listening to Scott? He I um, am. has an older machine and he has a couple generations behind and could probably use some assistance from the ASAA. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I will send you um, some information in your email. Okay. okay. Does that help, Scott? I mean, um, I mean, it's still it's still doing what it's supposed to do. I mean, I'm I'm still breathing through the night. Um, right. And it, as a matter of fact, I just had a polysomnogram um, about a month and a half, two months ago, where uh, they actually dropped my pressures a little bit. So, um, yeah, but I'm, uh, you know, it doesn't have, I, you know, it doesn't have the app that you can throw on your phone. It doesn't have, you know, like I said, they're not making smart cards anymore for it. And no, they're not. And, and the S8 is a great machine. It's a workhorse machine, but oh, it's, yeah. it's two generations behind at this point. And, and the ASAA will help you get another machine. And okay. with the sleep study that you just had with those new settings, when they provide you with the machine, they'll have it preset for you with the new settings yeah. and, and to get you up and going. And, and then you'll, you know, hopefully be able to get 
access to the apps and stuff that you want to have. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, um, last, I just want to say thanks for the presentation. You did an awesome job of explaining things. Um, like I said, I've been, I've, I've been doing this for a good while now, and I didn't see anything that I wouldn't agree with. <laughs> well, thank you, Scott. I appreciate that, and thanks for the vote of confidence. Um, and, yep. and Teresa is going to get in touch with you. All right, make sure you guys connect up. Um, yeah, I check my mail every day, so go ahead, Teresa, and fire it out. <laughs> okay, we'll do, Scott. Thanks. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Do we want to get back to Mike's uh, question? Uh, or was it uh, Medicare? Was that the one that you were talking about? Oh, yeah, about? Medicare. Uh, talking about oral appliances and CPAP. Um, we, uh, again, I work for the VA, and, and, and uh, we have a lot of our patients who are on CPAP. And, and in fact, some of the insurance providers actually want to see you try PAP therapy first and fail at PAP therapy before they'll pay for an oral appliance. Some will let you go to an oral appliance right away, but most of them will pay for both if that's what's needed. And we happen right. to have a lot of our patients who are on, uh, who wear an oral appliance and have PAP therapy on top of that. And the oral appliance does a couple of different things. One, it generally reduces the, the amount of pressure that's required with the oral appliance, which makes it more comfortable. And if it's more comfortable, you're more likely to wear it. And it does provide a secondary um, tool, if you will, that if you're going to travel and for some reason you can't take your PAP with you, you at least have your oral appliance, you know, that you can basically stick in your pocket and take it with you. So yeah, insurances and Medicare will cover uh, both, but there are some steps that you have to go through to make sure it, it happens. Yeah, it all depends on the insurance. It's the same with the myofunctional patients. They, you know, it, it's it's whatever their insurance is going to allow and whether or not there's a, a multidisciplinary team in place uh, to help that patient. I mean, it, to me, the ideal team is to have a dentist, a, you know, a, a sleep doctor, you know, a psychologist sometimes. There's, there's, there, it would be just wonderful if we all had that in place on our insurance. We have other questions here. We have some hands raised. Joy Muller, let's unmute her. Hi, Joy. Hi. Uh, my question is, you know, I am a myofunctional therapist and I do work in teams with dentists and uh, sleep physicians and EMTs and it's... Could you speak up, Joy? I'm sorry, we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, okay sorry. I said, I am a myofunctional therapist and I do work in teams with sleep physicians. Awesome. A dentist uh, and you know psychologists, all of it, the team approach seems to work really well. Mm -hmm. And the functional aspect of what you can do during the day, as far as getting the back of the tongue, the base of the tongue, functioning better, and the breathing uh, reduced to the point that you can handle. Uh, different types of CPAPs easier, it seems to really, really help the patients. And I just am hoping that access to care will be Im improved by insurance coverage, of course, but also more widely accepted by sleep, sleep physicians to recommend this treatment for their patients. Oh, I think, I think that it's, it's happening now uh, more than ever. I mean, I think when, I mean, if you think about sleep, medicine in and of itself is such a youngster still. I mean, it really has only been around widespread since probably like, you know, the 50s. I mean, even though the, uh, there were problems identified before then. That's when the real science took off in uh, the 60s and 70s. Uh, so, I mean, it, that's pretty young for, uh, for medical discipline. And I think that you see more and more 
uh, dental professionals and sleep professionals, you know, getting together more. And, and you know, that's, that's something that we applaud. Yeah, and I can tell you that I, I lecture all across the country, and one of the things that we talked about a lot is that the modern day sleep lab is not the sleep lab of yesterday. The modern day sleep lab is truly an integrated sleep disorder center, and we work closely with all types of therapy, including yours, including oral appliances, uh, dietary um, dietitians and cardiologists, pulmonologists, neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, cognitive therapy. We're beginning to incorporate all types of therapy. And, and in fact, we just did our first uh, Inspire implant. And if you don't know what Inspire is, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a future, um, um, future webinar as well. Mm -hmm. But it is, um, it's a growing field and it's beginning to incorporate all these specialty modalities uh, into sleep. So it's not just the big bread and butter, obstructive sleep apnea, throw a mask on them and send them home uh, lab anymore. We have certainly evolved. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. It was excellent. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for coming, Joy. And you know, the patients are not cookie cutter. I mean, everyone is different. Everybody's needs are going to be different, just as their faith is unique in, you know, when we are trying to uh, accommodate with masks uh, and all the individual, you know, nuances of the face. It's the same with the patient itself, you know, himself or herself. They're just, they're not cookie cutter. They're all different. And I think it should be on a case by case basis. So we definitely applaud that as, uh, as the ASAA. And I know Joe does too at, at uh, the VA. Yes, we do. Any other but, questions? Yes, we have a Patrick. Um, Falcone? Yes. Hi, Patrick. Hey, good. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Hey, so a quick question. Um, I've, you know, I'm not overweight, I'm, I'm fit, but I was, for like the past 10 years, I was just having very bizarre arrhythmias. Um, and I went to like five, six different cardiologists who just set, said it was stress because of work. Till one day I, um, it, I had a pretty bad one. Um, and then the cardiologist said, you know, I think you're having um, central sleep apneas. Um, I don't use drugs or anything like that. Um, but so I finally was able to get on an ASV. My question though is um, my arrhythmias have actually, you know, have gone completely. It's, it's quite, quite amazing, you know, that this therapy has helped so well. Um, but does, I know there was studies between ASV and heart failure. Um, and I just want to confirm that ASV therapy does not ultimately lead to heart failure, correct? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I can't say yes or no on that. I'm not a, first of all, I'm not a doctor. But with that said, I can tell you that when the, if it's the study that you're talking about that came out of Australia, New Zealand, something like that, it was a very limited amount of patients and the, the patients that were selected for that study, uh, the criteria used for that was pretty restrictive. What, what we have found in the labs that I work with is we simply look for an ejection fraction on the patient. And I don't want to get too technical in this particular presentation, but we look for the, the fact that the heart is working somewhat normal, and we use the number of 55% or better on ejection fraction before we'll put a patient on ASV. So we don't feel that ASV, if used correctly, is, is harming a patient's cardiac status at all um, because we are helping them with their central apneas. Now, with that, that said, Patrick, again, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, I'm a therapist. Um, so obviously, if you're on ASV, somebody along the line thought that that would work for you. So I, I don't think you should worry too much about it ca causing you any problem, but I certainly would continue to do all your follow-ups and make sure that that's the case. Does that make any sense to you? No, I'm yeah. not trying to dance around your question. I'm just, I'm not qualified to tell you 
Yeah. No. Even if I had your whole medical history, I'm not qualified to tell you 100%. Yeah, no, I mean, I was just wondering because like when I asked my sleep therapist, I mean, this was, you know, through the cardiologist's office and they said that I'm, I'm not at, at risk, but I still, it still is good to hear it from somebody else because the idea of something, a cardiac event happening because I'm on this type of therapy is, it could be, or, and is disconcerting. I mean, you know, I'm fit, I exercise, but I'm also worried right. about that. Um, when I look at my app, I have the, 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 ret, not, I have the Respironics um, iPhone app um, and it still says like I'm having hypopneas, like for example, 32 hypopneas and like, for example, 10 clear airway apneas at, at like a 4.4 AHI. And I'm wondering, th is that still um, a central apnea issue, even though I'm on an ASV machine? You, you could still be having central apneas, but I mean, I mean, you saw from looking at the, at the epics that we looked at, there's no way of, of knowing without actually having the, the data in front of a, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a medical provider who can look at it and see what's going on. Right. But I, but I can tell you this, this I can tell you with a hundred percent certainty, not treating the issues is going to definitely hurt your heart, continue to hurt your heart even worse. Right. No, I mean, as I said, I, I don't have the apneas. Uh, I mean, I don't have the, the arrhythmias and um, yeah, good. I've had them for, for years, for years. And it just got to the point where it's just getting just very uncomfortable. So it, it has helped. I mean, I can, I can just, and I'm not, and I'm no longer an insomniac now that I'm on ASV therapy because I haven't slept. And, so and for those of you out there who don't know what ASV is, just going to tell you, it's a very high end positive airway pressure, uh, more along a, a ventilator type, um, situation. So when we uh, down the road do a, a presentation on various types of PAP therapy, we'll include Absolutely. some of them. Absolutely. That would be wonderful. And I've just one final question in my email. Um, I just asked about for the, um, the, for the ASAA, are there any ASV um, machines that are available for um, discounted purchase with my insurance going up with the new administration, my deductibles have skyrocketed and my, now my monthly amount that I have to pay for the ASV is very, very steep. It's almost twice what I pay for my insurance. So do you guys have any, any information on that? Um, I don't know if we have any at the moment, I, but I can find out for you. If you want to send me um, an email, Okay. At, at uh, this is my email address, kind of silly, mother t as in Teresa at sleepapnea.org. And I will get you that information. Wonderful. Thank you, Ter uh, Teresa. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're it. welcome. You're welcome. Um, yeah. And um, Mr. Anderson, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the seminar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run off to go back to work. I appreciate everybody uh, and this resource. Thank you so very much. And oh, Mr. Falcon, you're welcome. You can call me Joe, please. Yeah. Thank, you, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Take care. You too. Bye. Well, let's see. Do we have any more questions? I think everybody has put their hands down. <laughs> um, All righty. But thank you to everyone. Thanks to Sean and Dr. Carl, and most of all, Joe, and really most of all, you that attended. We look forward to seeing you uh, next month, and be sure and catch Kevin, if you would like, uh, on our Facebook page this uh, Thursday night. There are uh, all kinds of ads out there about it, and Kevin is going to talk about your sleep environment making a comfortable sleep environment. And that would be 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can reach it on our regular ASAA Facebook page, or you can reach that on your Awake page. Well, thank you, Joe. Thanks for being here. And thanks, thank everybody. everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.